Hello everyone, welcome to Genealogy Adventures. My name is Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Hey guys, on this cold day in Maryland, it's cold to be May. <laughs> it is cold, but wherever you are, especially if you're in the States, we hope you're enjoying a, a nice, um, nice holiday weekend. And as always, thank you for sharing your hour with us today. So I'm gonna get right to it. Today, we are gonna be talking about black cowboys. Um, this is going to be a huge learning curve for Mia, for Donya. So we're really excited and we hope you guys are going to be excited to learn a lot of new stuff today too. So we are joined today by Larry Callies. He's the founder and CEO of the Black Cowboy Museum in Rosenberg, Texas. Larry was raised in El Campo, Texas, where he competed in calf roping and team roping in local rodeo circuits. And he had a promising country western singing career. While researching the history of the Black Cowboy, Larry Callies discovered that actually two of his ancestors, a Major James Kerr and Captain Isaac Newton, both Texans, um, well, basically they had father, they fathered children with some of their enslaved women and Harry, Larry is a descendant from both of them. Larry opened the museum to ensure the story of the United States Black Cowboys should never be forgotten. And just uh, some personal things about, about uh, Larry as well. He started rodeo at the age of 15. Can you imagine that? 15 years old on the black rodeo circuit, um, grew up on the ranch and his father, his grandfather and his great grandfather were all black cowboys. So he has a wealth of knowledge on the subject. So without further ado, welcome to the show, Larry. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Brian. So excited to have you on today. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I like to tell the people before I start talking, um, I have a problem with my voice. I used to be a country western singer. Uh, George Strait's manager was my manager at one time. Clint Black's band was my band. But I lost my band. I lost my manager. <clears throat> when I had caught something called vocal dysphonia, it's a nerve that attacked my voice cords <clears throat> and I can barely talk. I used to have to take Botox shots just to talk, but I'm a Christian first and I'm a cowboy sucker. That's what I want the people to know, that I'm a Christian first and I'm a cowboy sucker. And now we can talk about anything you want to. <laughs> <laughs> so as I said, I mean, you come from many, many gen generations of, of Black cowboys. What Growing up, I mean, being surrounded because you had cousins who were on, on the rodeo circuit, you had cousins and family members who were cowboys. What was it like being, I guess, a, a black child growing up in Texas with this real wealth of cowboy history that was literally in your household? Well, you would think it was really great, but it was tough in school because back in the 50s and the 60s, Black people wasn't known to be cowboys. And I went to a school, I was the only black cowboy in school. And I went to an integrated or a, a all black school till I was in the seventh grade. And all the black people would give me trouble. You know, when I walked down the hall, I'd be walking down the hall and I had these cowboy boots on. They'd trip me. <laughs> and I, you know, I'd fall to the ground. And I said, man, why you do that? And say, what you know in them white people boots on? I say, these are cowboy boots. I said, I, I'm a cowboy. My daddy was a cowboy. My grandpa was a cowboy. And I'm gonna wear these boots. Well, it got so bad that I was having fights almost every day. Mm. I asked my brother, I say, hey man, why do people want to fight me all the time? He said, you quit wearing them cowboy boots. They'll quit fighting you. Well, I didn't quit wearing them. I had a fight almost every day on the bus or in the school, but we integrated to the white school and it kind of stopped a little bit because it was a lot of white guys wearing boots and they wouldn't trip them, so they didn't trip me. But the white boys was asking me too, they said, hey, why you wear cowboy boots? This is, this is a white man's game. I say, well, I, uh, I'm in the game. <laughs> I'm, I'm a cowboy and I'm gonna stay a cowboy. 
well, they got to know me and I was working for the biggest stock producer in Texas. His name was Sloan Williams and uh, everybody knew him. And when they found out I worked for Sloan Williams, nobody ever messed with me again because they knew that I was a cowboy. And even the blacks started recognizing that, you know, I, I wasn't gonna stop wearing cowboy boots. And I grew up and I started singing country music because I used to work at a rodeo that just pushed country music on me every Saturday night. I learned all the songs, especially the ones by Charlie Pride. I had a song out about Charlie Pride. It's called A Little Bit of Charlie and Me. And uh, it did pretty good here in Texas and Houston. But when I lost my voice, that's when I lost all my singing career. But I went back to rodeo. I went back to my little first love. I started going back. I rode bulls. I rode back by horses. I was the second black in the state of Texas to make the state finals mm -hmm. in an all white rodeo. My cousin, Tex Williams, he was the first oh. in 1967. Can I just, can I jump in for a minute? I'm gonna, okay. I'm gonna keep Tex till a little bit later in the show. Okay, all right. So I wanna pick, pick up where you left off with you being in school. Okay. So I'd already said, you know, you're starting with your great grandfather, you had a history of black cowboys. And I, you know, I'm not giving away anyone's age. So it strikes me as really sad that between the end of the Civil War, which is when the black cowboys started, and we're gonna talk a lot more about that. So between the end of the Civil War to when you were going to school, that knowledge that black men were cowboys had already been lost. Not really, not with me, but because with your, everybody but with your, I grew up with were cowboys. With your classmates, yeah. Yeah, and the classmates, they didn't know anything about it. They watched a little TV. They never saw a black cowboy on TV in the 50s. And in the 60s, they never saw a black cowboy. The first black cowboy that he really kind of came on was in the um, 70s, but he was just, one person they thought no other you know black person would be a cowboy but there were thousands of cowboys in texas that were black okay so i'm going to talk a little bit about tv and then we're going to go to the origins of the black cowboy so <clears throat> before you know before the show when we were in our virtual green room i was saying you know i'm a child of the 60s that's when i was born and i grew up on a steady diet of black and white 1950s, 1960s, Western TV shows and movies. So things like Gunsmoke, Big Valley, Bonanza, The Outcasts, all those John Wayne movies. And there were only two, and I've actually binge watched them in preparation for this show because what I couldn't, I could only ever remember seeing one black cowboy ever in my childhood. And funnily enough, the one that came to mind was played by Lou Rawls and that was the Big Valley. Then we said that Bonanza had a black cowboy. I think there was also one of the outcasts, but I didn't see any in Gunsmoke or Rawhide. Or, mm -hmm. And if they were in a John Wayne movie, I think they were usually a cook. Mm -hmm. so, again, that great kind of propaganda machine that we call TV and movies really just obliterated the black presence in terms of in terms of being cowboys, and I mean, how do you think that's played out? Um, even you know, within Texas specifically, but you know, largely, mostly in the United States, that that missing part of our history and our contribution. That's why I opened this museum, is because of not seeing black cowboys on TV, and the reason is because of mostly one man. His name was Bass Reed. He was, a, he was the Lone Ranger. He was the real Lone Ranger. And um, because of him, they didn't put us on TV because they first put him on the radio. And when they found out he was black, the people didn't want to listen to the radio station. So, okay, wait a minute. I'm confused. So because, because he was a black man, Yep. They decided not to show him, and he's the reason why there were no black cowboys being shown. Yeah, because they, you need to know the story 
to understand why they wouldn't put blacks on TV. In 19, <clears throat> Bass Reeves was born in 1838. He was born a slave. When he turned 17, he hit his master. He knocked him out. He knew that was sudden death. So he stole the master's horse and rode to Oklahoma. He lived with the Indians for 20 years. The Indians taught him how to shoot, how to fight, how to track. They taught him all of Oklahoma. They taught him all the Texas. As long as he was riding with the Indians, he was free. Then in 1865, when they freed the slaves, he went to Oklahoma to the hanging judge, Judge Parker, to be a U.S. Marshal. Judge Parker said, hey, you have to know how to read and write. Bass Reeves said, I can't do either one, but I have a good memory. He said, okay, go get these five people. He named them. They were real bad, bad, bad guys. Bass Reeves, he said, you got a month to get them. And you can bring them back dead or alive. Bass Reeves brought all five of them back alive in three weeks. So they made him a U.S. Marshal. Do you know he lived to be 98 years old and he captured 3,000 convicts in his lifetime? Wow. And when he did that, they started singing about him. They started writing stories about him. One guy in 1933 had a radio show. He said, I'm gonna tell you the story of the Lone Ranger. The Lone Ranger rides again. And he did this. And then people thought it was a horse on the radio, you know? And they started listening to that show every Saturday night. And people started calling in saying, hey, who was the Lone Ranger? The guy didn't know any better. He said, oh, he was a black man. Oh, he had a thousand phone calls saying they wouldn't want to listen to his radio station anymore. He said, why? He said, because you said the Lone Ranger was a black man. He said, no, no. I didn't say he was a black man. I say he wore a black mask. Oh. Get oh. out. Oh, my God. <laughs> so in 1950, <laughs> they put him on the TV. He had to be a white man. With if a black man. Him, if they didn't accept him on the radio, they still sure weren't going to accept him with as a black man on a, on TV. So they put a black mask on him. But in in real in 1933, that the mask was like a Ku Klux Klan mask, but it was black. But they had to change it for TV. They couldn't wear he couldn't wear that kind of mask. So they put a mask on him like that. And if you ever watched it, he always had on black gloves. He was imitating a black man. And that's what you got the Lone Ranger. Can you, okay, this last three minutes finally <laughs> explains the relationship between the Lone Ranger and, and Tonto. Tonto. Yes. Because <laughs> I never, ever understood what was going on there. Yes, yes, <laughs> it really did. Because I was going to say the same thing. And you don't now know. I know where Tonto comes in at. No, you don't. Okay, what? <laughs> no, you don't. So where Tonto, does Tonto come in? The funniest story. Okay, when they put the Lone Ranger on, they knew Bass Reeves had, he lived with the Indians. They had, Indians helped him catch 3,000 convicts. So they wanted an Indian with the Lone Ranger on TV. He, he made five episodes without the, the Tonto. But they wanted a real Indian name. So they went from Hollywood to New Mexico to an Indian tribe in New Mexico, or a reservation, an Indian reservation. They, they asked the Indians, said, hey, what would you call an Indian that would ride with a white man with a white hat, white horse, and a black mask? The Indians thought for a minute, they said, call him Tonto. 
man, they loved it. They went back to California and they said, we got a perfect name, Lone Ranger and Tonto. So they made it, they made him Tonto. You know what Tonto means? I was going to ask you, what does it stand for? Stupid, idiot. <laughs> any, any white man, any Indian that would ride with a white man had to be stupid because they put him on a reservation, they kill most of them, and then they're going to come there and ask him, what would you tell them? So they said, mind blown. <laughs> mind blown. Isn't that crazy? But do you know the Lone Ranger, or uh, uh, Bass Reeves, he captured 3,000 convicts without getting shot or wounded? I'm talking about the meanest people in Oklahoma. That's where all the, the bad guys went to Oklahoma. He captured 3,000 without getting shot. Uh. So when he died, well, there's another important part that I like. When he captured those people, he preached to every one of them. He took his hat off and he would preach to them. He would tell them about the Bible and doing the right thing. So he's never been wounded. When he died, they went to his house to get this um, jacket he wore, this long jacket. And they pulled it off the rack and it had bullet holes all in the sides. Oh, wow. People so he was shot at, but never shot. Never shot. Yes, so he most definitely. Man, that man, he went through some stuff. But he never got shot or wounded. Wow. That's something. Isn't that something? Wow. So talking about this history, <clears throat> so it's 1865. And I know the liberation of enslaved people in Texas was later than that, which is why we have June 9th, Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for argument's sake, Civil War ends, I guess pe the Texans are slowly going back home and that they've got their cattle all over the place. So can you pick up the story from there about how Black Cowboys even came into being? Well, this is why I know there was only Black Cowboys in the 1860s. They were free. They had to roam with the ranch because the slave owner needed somebody to round up the cows. They didn't have fence. The barbed wire wasn't invented till 1860s, 1865s, 1870s. Okay. So oh, they didn't have barbed wire to keep their cattle in. They would let the slaves go out, but they would pay them. They would pay the slaves to ride horses. They would pay the slaves to break horses. And they were the first cowboys. So when the white man was all fighting the war in the 1960s, the black cowboy was driving herds to Louisiana. Oh, okay. There's a, there's a, um, there were some people that I've read about that went to Louisiana to drive cattle. And then they started driving cattle to Kansas. Um, and guess who they were? They were the black men. You know why? Because they had to put the black man, a slave, put a gun on him. Because they had Indians in, the, in 1860. They had people that would rob their cattle. They had to have somebody that was honest and local. They were slaves, but they were getting paid. Mm. They were getting $10 a month to drive cattle from here to Kansas. Mm. It just didn't start in 1865 when the slaves were free. They were paying the, the, the black cowboy to, to ride horses and, and work, to work cattle to go to Kansas. So what do you think was the kind of criteria that, a, that an enslaver was looking for? So if you had a choice between, I don't know, two people, why would the enslaver say, well, I want you to be one of my cowboys, but you, no, not, not so much. Were, were there characteristics that they were looking for? Yes, there were characteristics. As long as they wasn't white. You know why? why because that? white men could drive 
If he's, uh, he's got two or three white men driving cattle with about 15 or 20 blacks, a white man could kill the, the owner's son and go in and take the money when they get to Kansas. And they just ride off. A black man couldn't do that. If you saw a black man with $20,000 back in the 1860s, they gonna either kill him, rob him, or whatever. He couldn't spend that money. So that's why he had to trust the black man to even bring the money back. If a, if a white man, you know, he went up there, to, he wouldn't hire a white, white man to, because a white man could shoot him in the back and take his clothes and said hey, he was that person. Mm. He was the slave owner's son. You know, mm. a black man couldn't do that. So now I'm a little bit, now I'm even more confused because if there was like an honor code between the enslaver and his enslaved cowboys, why the resistance to black cowboys? Why have they been erased or talked down or, or diminished? Because the white man didn't want people to know the black cowboys did it, just like they wouldn't put them on TV. They tried to say it was the Hispanic people. Uh -huh. But there wasn't no Hispanic people, you know why? Because I've done my research and they didn't have this many people in Texas in 1860s, 1865, 1870s. Hispanics didn't start coming back. The war with uh, Mexico in 1836, yeah. they drove all the Mexicans out of Texas, all except for San Antonio. And they took their land. They drove them out of Texas, took their land, and uh, Hispanic people couldn't come back to Texas because they were sympathetic to the slaves. Mm. Santa Ana came here to stop slavery, but he got beat. They, they um, kicked his rear end pretty good and they sent him back to Mexico. And he, he signed a treaty that he wouldn't come back. And they took the land. They took the land, and that's what happened. Wow. And then they tried to say in the, in the history books, if you see 10 cowboys back in Texas, uh, one was black, two or three were Hispanic, and the rest of it was white, that's not even true. That's not true at all. They were all black. In the 1800s, a cowboy was, a, was the only cowboy. And then they tried to say the word vaquero meant cowboy. No, it doesn't. The vaquero came from buckaroo. That's the word for vaquero, not cowboy. What's that word again? Vaquero? Vaquero. Okay. I see the white <clears throat> in, the, in the history books, they tried to say the vaqueros were the cowboys. No, they wouldn't. They were the black men. They, the vaqueros were Hispanic, but they were in Mexico from 1836 to the 1870s and 80s. They started letting Mexicans back. But let me tell you something. You just got like the, I've been watching the feed and I swear you have people just wow. That's all I keep seeing is wow, wow, wow. No one knew these things, and and it's just amazing the stories I'm that you have. I'm writing a book. I'm telling you part of this, but there's one thing I'm not sharing, and there's a lot of stuff I'm not sharing because I'm writing a book. I'm I'm sharing a little bit so people will say, "Hey, I want to buy that book when it comes." Yes. Out. Yes. And there's a lot more to this story than what I'm telling. And I got my buddy here that writes the book, Mr. Buford. He's a he's a writer, and he's gonna write the book. We writing a book now, but this one is coming out later. Wow! And just I finally got the nerve to tell these.
these stories because I didn't want somebody to come here and try to, you know, mess with my museum. Right. No, I can, I can definitely appreciate that. And to give the audience just a flavor of how entrenched blackness is with the cowboys, I understand there's some maneuvers or, um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them maneuvers that were actually created by black cowboys. Yeah, that was a lot of it. Uh, but they, they gave it to the Hispanic cowboy. There were uh, the black cowboy, when, he, when we rodeo, you know who, who the first rodeo people were? The black cowboys. Right. Because on the big ranches, they had the best of the best. And they would go and say, hey, I have a picture of like 18, 18, 70, 1880. I have a picture of a black man riding a bull in the, and they had some old cars and uh, they were surrounded by the ranch and they would watch black people ride the, the bulls, the horses. And uh, that's where the road came from but the black man didn't invent the rodeo he started the rodeo but the white man said hey we got something here you know we can put the white guys and then we could have a rodeo so they made the rodeo but they wouldn't let us ride you know why because the black man was forced to be the cowboy on most of the ranches in texas they would have the black man get up at five o'clock in the morning, go ride the horses that would buck early in the morning. They call them, they call them cold back. When they're cold back, they want to buck. So they put the black man on the horse to, to tame him down. Then the white man go out there and take the horse and they go work the cows. So if you can talk a little bit about <clears throat> the the rodeo circuit, because I understand there was the black rodeo circuit and then the white rodeo circuit. But the other question I have for you, is it true that they gave the meanest, bad tempered, worst tempered bulls to the black cowboys? On the yes, they did. Yes, they did. The, when they let us ride, that was a man named Willie Thomas. He was the first black to ride in a pro rodeo. He drove all the way from here in Houston he lived in Sugar, I mean, in uh, Rosenberg, but he drove all the way to San Antonio to be in a white rodeo, a professional rodeo. And they told him he couldn't ride in that rodeo until the rodeo was over. So he waited till the rodeo was over. They gave him the meanest bull that has never been ridden. Well, Willie Thomas rode him. <laughs> He still didn't win first. He should have. But it was a newsman there. He told this in San Antonio in the newspaper. And uh, the people got upset because they didn't see this book get wrote. So they called the Pro Rodeo Association. And the Pro Rodeo Association said, whenever a black man ride after the rodeo, two whites are gonna have to ride. So that made them let us ride. So we started riding after Willie Thomas had done that. He's a good friend of mine. He's got, I got his picture right here. He had a brother named James Thomas. They were, they were born on the George Ranch. See, these rules just blew my mind. So what, having two white people right after a black radio person was because what to no see if they gonna make the black men ride after the rodeo hmm. they gonna have to have two white men ride so that made them let everybody ride together but it was so hard they had white judges whenever the white judge would judge you you didn't win in the 50s, it's very few blacks won first place in a white rodeo back in the 50s and 60s. I grew up in the rodeos. My daddy used to work for the biggest stock producer in, in, in Texas. His name was Sloan Williams. And I was a little 
kid. I was eight years old when I used to work for him. And I would work the back gate. I graduated to the back to where I worked the bulls and the horses. And I saw the best riders I've ever seen in these rodeos. Now, don't get me wrong. There were a lot of good white cowboys. I mean, there was white cowboys that blacks couldn't be. And there was black cowboys that whites couldn't be. My cousin, Tex Williams, he was the first black to get in all white rodeos in the state of Texas in 1967. They let him in. And when he rode, he won state champion in 67. And he won it in 68. Guess who the second black was? Who was that? You're talking to him. Oh, no. <laughs> 1971. 1971. I have, a, I have the state finals. Youth Rodeo in the state of Texas, 1971. I'm in the fabric ride and they got my, they got a, a program. Mm -hmm. I told that when I was on TV on Channel 26 one time, and uh, I didn't have that state finals um, plaque. A white girl saw it and she said, well, no blacks in our rodeo. So she looked it up, she had a program and she sent it to me and I blew it up. <laughs> made it big and put it in my museum. Wow. This it strikes me as incredibly sad that anyone thinks that that was an okay thing to say. There are no Blacks on our radio. I mean, Brian, it strikes me as sad because they felt like they needed to, to, to check him mm -hmm. every time he said something. So it's just like, it's, it's just amazing. Like we are unable to do these types of things. Like this is just not something you know, that we could do, so. Well, but that's, that's what happened back in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, it still happens today, <laughs> unfortunately. I, I used to have to go around to the back of the, the restaurant to eat. I used mm. to have to go to the back of the stores like Ashwin's in the 50s to shop. And we couldn't shop where the white people shopped in the same store. We had to be in the back where they have used stuff. And that's what we shot. So I'm going to take a little bit back further in time, going back to the back to the 1800s. So I'm thinking about these these enslaved men who were being entrusted with money, being away from their enslaver for days, weeks, maybe even months at a time. Apart from, I guess, the the head cowboy who would feel a sense of responsibility and to make sure that the money or whatever else got back to the enslaver. What was it that allowed the rest of the cowboy party to come back? Because I'm thinking I'm on a horse. I'm outside of Oklahoma or Kansas. I'm not married. Why am I going to go back to Texas to be a slave? I, I, I've got you know a horse. Why? Anyway. Because they had a wife back there. They had family. They don't get paid until they get back there. Mm. Okay. <laughs> they don't get paid until they get back. Right. And that's when, hey, and if they ran off, they're scared somebody else gonna enslave them. They gonna be out there picking cotton. And this was more freeing than that. This was way a lot more. That is how I worked my way out of the cotton field in the 50s. Uh. I worked so hard in the cotton field, but I wanted to be with my dad. He was a cowboy. And I wanted to ride horses and, you know, work cows. I got so good, my dad had to come by every time and blow the horn and say, hey, Larry, can you come help me? <laughs> and I was, I was gone. I was out of that cotton field. Then I found out this is the way the black cowboys did it in the 1860s. And that's how they stayed out of it. Wow. That's how they stayed out of it. So Brian, are you going to ask the question that's just going to make the feet go crazy or do you want me to ask it? By all means, you. <laughs> okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question so you can tell the story. What is the difference between cow hand and cowboy? All right. Back in the 1820s, they had men or boys, they 
would call them and tell them, say, we have a house boy, a yard boy, and somebody worked the cows. He was called a cowboy. When the master would go and ask for a boy, or they used to call him the N-word, they would say, go get that N that works in the you know, house. That's my house N. They say, go get that in that works in the yard. That's my house in. Then they started calling the, the, the boys that work the cows. They would say, go get that in that works the cows. Well, they kind of rebelled on that because they were kind of free. They started getting that little freedom. You know, they're working his cows. They know he needed them. They wouldn't come if they called him. Go get that in that works the cows. So um, the owner of the ranch would say, go get me that boy that worked the cows. That's my cowboy. That's where the word came, cowboy. Mm. But the word boy means a servant. Yeah. And a white man knew that. And the white man knew the way that word originally came from because they worked on the ranches they were part of that stuff so they would be called cowboys if you call a white man in the 1800s a cowboy he said i'm not your boy so they called him a cow hand or a cow man or a cow puncher or a cow driver but they didn't call him a cowboy until in the 1900s, they started calling them cowboys when they started seeing cowboys on TV. And the old guys died out. You know, they the ones that was born in the 1850s and 60s, they were dying out. So the white man didn't know where that word came from, especially in Hollywood. When Hollywood heard about them cowboys down in Texas, they thought they were talking about white men. So they would call themselves cowboys. Hey, I'm a cowboy. And that's where the word came from. And we didn't make it famous, but we inherited that word. We inherited that, that, that position. Wow. So essentially history had so successfully edited black people out and had so completely whitewashed the whole mythology behind the cowboy that that's it even the white cowboys didn't know where the word came from but do you know what the original word was what it came from africa there were herdsmen there were black men riding horses and there were herds and cattle see at first in 700 Africans invaded Spain. Hmm. They took over Spain. And they lived there for 800 years. And that's where Spain got the horses from. In Africa. Uh -huh. when they were in Africa, they saw these big Watusis. Uh, African cows with the big horns. They wanted those cows because they could live in the desert and mixed with their cows. And when they mixed their cows to their cows, guess what they came up with? The Longhorn. <laughs> Christopher Columbus brought the horses that they got from Spain to, Texas, to uh, Mexico in 1492. But it was dry over here in Mexico. And he said, man, we got some cows back in Spain we can bring and they can live in this kind of desert because they didn't know why the cow could live like that. But do you know why he could live like that? In the desert without water for 50 miles because of those horns. It's the horns, yeah. Cause it's <laughs> like, now that I can, I can guess that um, cause that's the same thing with um, elephants and their ivory. And the camel. Yeah. The camel has that hump. That's where he stores his water. 
the um, Longhorn, the Watusi, had those big horns. That's why the, the Spain wanted them from Africa. Because in Africa, it was real dry, it was real hot. And they was going, how did these cows live like that? So they wanted to mix their cows with them. Uh. And when Christopher Columbus came over here, he saw that it was dry. So he went back and got the Longhorn. He brought him in his second trip. He had 30 ships. He had chickens, pigs, longhorns, cow horses, and everything. Uh. He brought them off. They started breeding so much and breaking away and coming to Texas. And that's when they came to Texas. Because the grass was 10 feet high. The trees were 40 feet high. And uh, this was a perfect place for them. That is so amazing. Like this, the history lesson that you are giving on this show today is just wow. <laughs> it, all, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And I can prove every bit of it. And that's what makes it even better. The fact that you can prove it. So we have a question on here. Do you mind, Brian? Nope, not at all. Okay, so Rita Davenport, she says, were some of the black cowboys also the Buffalo Soldiers in the Civil War. Yes, they were. That's where the Buffalo Soldier came from. They were riding horses and working cattle. And the cattle business started fading out. The white guys started taking their jobs. And so they started going into the army and making more money. Uh. It was a move to make more money and not to have that hard work. Being a cowboy was a hard, hard job. That's amazing. Your story is amazing. So um, I have a question personally. The Black Museum, when did it open? The Black Cowboy Museum, when did you open it? July 2017. Actually, June. Okay. In the middle of June. It was almost like Juneteenth. <laughs> It's almost like Juneteenth, okay. And and do you get a lot of visitors? Um, like, what 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 kind of things do you show? Because I actually saw on YouTube, and I wanted to let everybody know that until stuff gets back in to the swing of things, I know Texas is is a little fur faster than others are, but you actually have a virtual tour on YouTube, right? right? And so you can always just type in the Black Cowboy Museum for YouTube and watch it. But why don't you tell us some of the things that you have? Because you had something in there that we actually discussed a couple of weeks ago, which were the badges yeah. of the slave patrol. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, it's that it was the badge that started the um, sheriff. The Texas Ranger, the Marshal, and it was a badge, and it says Slave Patrol. Yeah, I saw it. Slave Patrol. In 1858, South Carolina. And that was the badge that started the rest of the badges. Uh. See, we always starting something, ain't we? <laughs> We always start. Yeah, we are. That's my little joke in the museum. Whenever people look at it, they say, Larry, I've never seen anything like this. I've never heard anything like this. When they come to this museum, they're going to hear something and see something they've never seen. And trust me, all this stuff I've told you, there's a lot more about cowboys, about Oh, it just about why Texas is Texas. It's 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 about the Alamo. It's about the the yellow roads of Texas. I'm not gonna tell that story. <laughs> so, in terms of your exhibition pieces, I mean, where do a lot of them have you had to buy most of them? Do people send them in to you? You know what? When I open my doors. I said I was going to open up a black cowboy museum. People started bringing old stuff in their garage, old stuff in their attics. I have a satchel here. I'm looking at right now from 1949. 
It's a saddle that was donated to my museum. It has a state champion, Hallisville, Texas. And they didn't start making these saddles until 1946. And I have one that's from 1949. I have a saddle from the 1800s. I have three saddles from the 1800s. Uh -huh. I have a, a, a real Buffalo soldier sword from 1850. It was a real Buffalo soldier. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I have a, a bag, a, a feed bag from the 1800s, the real Buffalo soldier that they put on the feed bag. It came from the same person. I have a picture that was drawn of a real Buffalo soldier. I have, I have my family tree <laughs> and I come from two slave owners. Uh, one was from Edna, Texas, the other one from Hallisville, Texas. And the one from Edna, Texas was on my father's side. And the one from Hallisville is on my mother's side. And the reason they're in this book or um, I got it off the internet and they were having kids with slaves. And I trace my great, great, great grandmother from that um, thing that they had about, he, he had 12 slaves. I mean, he had 12 kids by slaves. Uh -huh. One woman named Cynthia, he had kids, six, six kids with her. Uh -huh. Now, my mother's side, I always wondered why my mama was, was um, light complected, but she would never tell me. She just said, boy, you from Hallisville, and that's all you need to know. So when I opened this museum, I met a lady called me. She said, Mr. Callis, I want to donate a slave house to you. I said, wow, that's a big thing. I said, where is it? She said, it's in pieces. It's in West Columbia, Texas. She was a historian. And I noticed her name was Naomi Mitchell Carrier. And I went, ma'am, I noticed your name is Mitchell. I said, where y'all come from? She said, we come from Hallisville. That's where my mom came from. She said, well, hello, cuz. <laughs> I said, whoa, wait a minute. It's been years. She said, I bet your mom is light complexed. I said, yeah, and she won't tell me why. She said, that's because she comes from a slave owner in Hallisville, Texas. Uh -huh. And I have that article about him in Hallisville, Texas. Uh -huh. Then I had a guy to come here. He was, he heard the story I'm telling you and he wanted to trace my family. And he traced it all the way back to King Edward IV and Queen Elizabeth in 1452. Uh, Before I can go back because of the slave owners. And a lot of people who do research don't realize you're actually pointing out something that Brian and I talk about all the time. You have to research your white family in order to find your black family. That's and, right. and, and, and that's, that's the direction that you ended up going because we don't have to be stuck at the 1870s. Right. You know, we really don't have to be stuck there. If it's a choice. Right. In my opinion, it's a choice to be stuck at the 1870s if you choose not to look at your white family. Because whether you like it or not, they are your family. That's right. Uh, you would not be here if they were. They didn't do what they did, regardless of how it happened. Do you like it? No, or anything like that. But the bottom line is, is, is that that's what that's the bottom line. You wouldn't be here without it, yeah. and um, that's a piece that made you. So to be able to go back that far, you have to research your white line. Right. Yeah, but I have another question up here that some people already know the answer to, some don't. I didn't know this was on Netflix. Were you in a film called High on the Hog on HBO? <laughs> yes, I was in that. I'm in that. That came out Wednesday. Huh? That came out Wednesday. 
Okay, so people are talking about it. They're like, he was just in a film. <laughs> and, and, hey, you know the, the Concrete Cowboy? You heard that movie? Yes. They got all their information from this museum. Are when you serious? Down, yes, when they came down, the Netflix came down two years ago. And they filmed me and they talked to me. Well, they shared that information with that movie. And I'm going, hey, that's what I <laughs> Oh, he just froze. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Mr. Buford. Can you hear me? They have a second computer. Oh, there you are. There you are. Because <laughs> I wanted to ask you the question, um, because I don't live in Texas and um, don't get Texas papers and whatnot. If Texas isn't already in a place to embrace the history of non-white cowboys, do you see a time period when that's going to happen, when they, when they can take as much pride in that history as any other history? Some people are taking, you know, but there's a lot of people who's not going to take it. Uh, I have a lot of white people coming here. I have a lot of black people coming here. But when I first opened it up, there wasn't a white person would walk in here. You know, uh, I, because I called it a black cowboy museum. The radio, TV stations, I had four of them to tell me, don't call it that. He said, that's racist. He said, we can't have a white cowboy museum. <laughs> I said, y'all already had them. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> then he said, yeah, but you're just being racist back. I said, no, I'm not. I said, I call this a black cowboy museum because I'm black. This is my museum. And then he was, well, yeah, you can't call it an all black cowboy. I said, I'm, this is not an all black cowboy museum. I said, I have white cowboys all in here. I have a cowboy from 1950, the wonderful 1949, he's a white cowboy. But, the one in 1954, Sasato, he's white. Uh, you know, all I have to do is come in here and see it's not an all black cowboy museum. It was an all black cowboy museum. I say, you're reading it wrong. I said, it's a black cowboy museum. I said, I'm a black cowboy. I mean, Can I name it a black cowboy museum? And it's my museum. I get it. That's right. You get it? <laughs> <laughs> they tried to stop me. Hey, that was a black uh, rodeo. They, they stopped it. They said, you got to name it a, the cowboy of color or the cowboy of the, the colored cowboy or whatever, you know, they wanted to name it. But I stuck to my guns and I said, I'm a black cowboy. It's a black cowboy museum and that's it. <laughs> I wasn't being racist. So, well, again, that seems to be a trend that anytime we reclaim our place in history or our history or our contributions to history, we're right. called, we're called racist for doing it. Yeah. yeah. And also, I'd like to tell the crowd, I don't know how long we have, uh, that I started this. Yeah, a couple of more minutes. I, I started this with my own retirement. I worked for the post office. I retired from the post office. And just about every bit of this money that's in this museum came from me. And it's a nonprofit. I'm a nonprofit. I got to be a nonprofit. And, um, you know, if somebody were don't to the museum, just look up the Black Cowboy Museum. We'll put that link. We'll put that link in the um. Okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, we'll put that link in. Well, Brian, did you have anything else to say? It's like five minutes out. Unless there's another question. I don't have any other questions. Just, just, I just want to let you know that you have wowed this entire audience. Um. Everything that you've said, I've, I've seen wow, I've seen mind blown, I've seen speechless, I've seen, I mean, you have just really done its thing, done its thing. Um, one question from Rita Davenport, and make it, if you can answer quickly, we would appreciate it. It says, is the Black Rodeo Association a real name? Yes, it still is. 
It still is. It still is. I used to belong to the Black Rodeo Association. <laughs> it used to be called the Black. Uh, and then, uh, hold on a second. used to be called the Southwest National Color Association, but now it's called the Southwest National Cow Association. Wow. They, they, they couldn't say black back in them days, but I never considered myself as colored. I mean, I'm, I'm black. <laughs> and, uh, well, you know, I used to have it on a thing, or you colored, or, you know, African. Yeah. African American, I scratch out colors and I say black. You know, if the white man can put white, are you, know, you white? And he could be from Spain or Africa or somewhere. He was but he could still white. put white. He yeah. still can put white. He don't have to put African American. There were white uh, white Africans in Africa. So why do I have to put African American? I put black. If he put white, I put black. <laughs> well, I would like to thank you for being on the show for so. I would seven. like to thank y'all for having me. And it was nice meeting you, Brian. Nice meeting you too. And again, thank you so much for um for sharing your knowledge. And it, it really has been like a non-stop wow. Yeah. <laughs> from our audience. It, it's yeah, been a non-stop wow for me all these years. Yeah, you you <laughs> I, have been I had, a, I, had a, I had a white guy call, he said. In 1986, he said, okay, he was, I was coming into a club. He was coming out with about five or six people. He said, oh, now I've seen everything. There's a black cowboy. <laughs> and I just had to laugh at him and walked on in the club. Uh -huh. he, he said, wow, I've, I've seen everything now. There's a black cowboy. Uh-uh. Uh well, we want to thank you again, you know, for definitely being on the show uh, next week, next Sunday, June 6th. Seems like that's going to be a very uh, popular show because this show is going to be about um, how in, how enslaved families got their surname. Okay. So right. I just want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, this has been an awesome show. I'm I'm still mind blown. I hope my mom was able to watch it because she definitely wanted to catch it. And the name of the movie that I was telling you about was McClintock with uh, John Wayne and Maureen O'Hara. It's funny. If you don't know what I'm talking about, definitely look it up. Because that is a funny uh, movie. I've seen just about every movie on the Cowboy movie, but there's a couple I hadn't seen. But yeah. I want to let the people know that they have black cowboy movies. If you look hard, from 1838, 1838, they're real movies. They're real cowboys, and it's all black crew. Oh wow! Herbert Jeffries, he's the best one. He's not really black, but he he um he wanted to be. <laughs> <laughs> he said he wanted to be. If you if you look up the story, it'll tell you why he 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 wanted to be black. Mm -hmm. Wow. Nineteen twenty five, nineteen thirty eight, and nineteen twenty three was Bill Pickett. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. They talked about him. Yeah. So we're we're out of time. We are definitely out of time. But I want to thank you again for being on the show. Thank you. Uh, Yes. Thank you once again. And thank, thank you, Brian. You. Appreciate it. And thank you, everyone at home. Uh, we hope you, you found this as much of a jaw dropping episode as we have. And we will see you right here next week, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm Brian Sheffy. And I'm Donya Williams. Have a great I'm day. Larry <laughs>